Hello, everyone. Welcome to the People's Forum. Welcome to everyone who's joined us in person. It's so lovely to see this full space uh, with everyone here for this event. And welcome to everyone who's joining us also online. My name is Leanne. I am the Education Director here at the People's Forum. And I'm absolutely excited and thrilled to be um, welcoming you all to this event, which not only is this uh, launch of this book, which I hope everyone is picked up and is reading, Colonizing Kashmir State Building Under Indian Occupation by Hafsa Kanjwal, is not only such an important launch because of the book itself, but also is very dear to all of us here at the People's Forum because Hafsa is uh, not only someone that we look to for, in, for analysis and um, orientation and for uh, information about what's going on in Kashmir, which is one of the most uh, crucial areas to understand, to understand today's world and the way militarism colonialism and imperialism works today. But also Hafsa has been a dear friend and comrade of the People's Forum for now, I think since nearly the beginning. Um, and it feels like only yesterday that it was a few years ago that we had filled the space um, with so many people from the Kashmiri community and people in solidarity with uh, the Kashmiri struggle. And since then we have really learned a lot through our collaborations and uh, teaches, teachings and workshops with Hafsa. Uh, so it's been uh, long overdue that the world has been waiting for a book by Hafsa. So I'm very, very pleased that we are able to launch this book here in New York City um, and to have both Hafsa and Junaid here. So what we're going to do is I'll introduce you both and then we will pass it on to you for a presentation and discuss discussion and then we'll have a discussion with everyone here in the room. So uh, Hafsa Kanjwal is the author of tonight's book and a professor of South, a South Asian history at Lafayette College and also has written many uh, pieces and uh, points of analysis on Kashmir in many different uh, news, art, art, uh, news outlets like the Washington Post, Al Jazeera and others. And Mohammed Junaid is a professor of anthropology at Massachusetts College. He's written many books on Kashmir, which would take uh, a while to list right now, and also has written for many different news outlets. You can find his writing in Economic and Political Weekly, also Al Jazeera, and more. So with that, I want to extend a huge welcome to both of you and uh, our greatest uh, welcome and congratulations for this very important book. And I will pass it over to you, Hafsa. Okay, hello and salam everyone. Um, thank you so much for being here. It's so nice to see um, some friendly phrases and I'm really grateful to all of you for taking time out this Friday night. Um, so tonight's event marking the publication of Colonizing Kashmir, um, a project that took me more than 10 years to complete, comes at the eve of the fourth anniversary of one of the most dreadful days in Kashmir's recent history. On August 5th, 2019, India embarked on the next phase of its settler colonial project in Indian-occupied Kashmir. It is not an exaggeration to say that in the past four years, Kashmiris have been effectively silenced, as India has changed a series of laws that now allow its citizens and its armed forces to buy land and settle in the territory um, basically with the intention to change the demographics from a Muslim majority to one um, that would have, uh, be full of Indian settlers so that Kashmir's long-standing movement for self-determination and sovereignty can be quashed. And this is all happening under a neoliberal global order led by the U.S., which is also making Kashmir a site of global extraction and environmental destruction. In recent years, the Indian government has completely gone after all forms of political um, and p potential dissent in Kashmir, from imprisoning its pro-freedom leadership to targeting writers, journalists, artists, academics, human rights defenders um, in a variety of different ways. So just for one example, this past week, uh, the passports of dozens of Kashmiris, many of them who were journalists and academics, were revoked. So writing and saying anything that portrays the Indian government in a negative light, forget even speaking about liberation or freedom, is a cause for harassment, interrogation, and imprisonment. We are in a moment of profound crisis, but one that reveals the urgency to educate ourselves so that we can act, act collectively for what lies ahead. 
So my hope is that my book, or this book, can help us situate the longer history of India's rule in Kashmir. As you can imagine, the Indian state, uh, through its effective use of soft power in the past seven plus decades, as well as the strength of its diaspora in the United States, including in government, the academy, and the media, has been able to craft a particular narrative about Kashmir to the international community. And so to see beyond this narrative and to actively work against the ways in which India normalizes its occupation in Kashmir is basically the task at hand. So what is this book about? Colonizing Kashmir talks about a decade from 1953 to 1963 when this man, he's already up there, um, Bakshi Ghulam Mohammed uh, was in power in Kashmir as the prime minister. At this time, the entire region of Kashmir was divided between the two new nation states of India and Pakistan following the first India-Pakistan War of 1947 to 1948. The UN had called for a plebiscite to be held in the region once hostilities ceased so that Kashmiris could determine their own future. Part of the territory, known today as Azad Kashmir and Gilgit Baltistan, came under Pakistan, while a substantial part came under Indian control. The region referred to as Jammu and Kashmir, Indian Occupied Kashmir, or just simply Kashmir. This is where I conducted my research. Right from 1947, India colonized the part of Kashmir under its rule. It placed its own client regimes in power and no negotiated some levels of autonomy, which was enshrined in something called Article 370 of the Indian Constitution. The article itself was a colonial treaty that was meant to placate Kashmiris into thinking that being under Indian rule would be for their benefit. It allowed the state to have its own constitution, lawmaking body, and the leader of the state was even called the prime minister. Yet, the first uh, client politician, his name was Sheikh Abdullah, who initially agreed to Kashmir's accession to India, began to backtrack, thinking that um, the Indian state was not actually interested in granting Kashmiris their autonomy. And so the Indian government removed him in a coup, and he was replaced by his deputy, Bakshi. Just trying to see. Okay. Um, when I began my PhD research around a decade ago, I found that most of the scholarship primarily focused on the events around the 1947 partition and then the period after the late 90s, 1980s, when an armed rebellion and a mass, mass popular uprising began in Kashmir against the Indian state. Most of it was narrated through the lens of the Indian state, in which the Kashmiri movement for liberation was referred to as either secessionism or terrorism. Kashmiris have always contested these narratives. In recent decades, they've attempted to write themselves into history through scholarship, journalism, and literature. But I found that there was very little work that was done in the period be uh, between partition and the uh, mass movement of the late 1980s. And so I was drawn to this period. The dominant narrative of this period is that things were normal during this time and that it was only because of Pakistani interference or India's lack of commitment to development or secularism or democracy that Kashmiris became disillusioned or alienated is often a term that you hear. And that's what led to the armed rebellion um, and intense militariza militarization and human rights violations committed by the army. But my book argues that the decade that Bakshi was in power actually consolidated the contours of India's colonial occupation by relying on those very same discourses and practices of development, secularism, democracy, and empowerment. And I historicize India's occupation and show that it may have looked different in this time period in comparison to what happened in the late 1980s with the brutal militarization but it was still very much involved in suppressing Kashmiri demands for self-determination and sovereignty. In these early years of India's colonial rule over Kashmir, the Indian government and its client regime saw Kashmiris as being, um, or saw Kashmir not in political terms. They saw it in, uh, meaning they didn't see it as an issue of sovereignty or self-determination, but rather in economic terms, linked to a better standard of living. Kashmiris were depicted as being malleable and that they had varying political aspirations, 
but that as long as they could experience the benefits of being under India, they could be integrated as Indians. So both governments, meaning the Indian government and the Kashmir client regimes, thought that Kashmiri sentiments could be managed and in many ways bought through state planning. And they attempted to show Kashmiris the many benefits that they could get um, under Indian rule, benefits that they couldn't necessarily have any, under any other political setup, as well as benefits that were not given to Indian states, actual other Indian states. And I argue that the early decades of India's occupation was marked by a politics of life. And I borrow this term from the scholar Nev Gordon, who uses it similarly to describe uh, how Israel attempted to create prosperity in the West Bank and Gaza Strip after the 1967 war. The politics of life refers to how Indian government and its client regimes propagated development, empowerment, and progress to secure the well-being of Kashmir's population and to normalize the occupation for multiple audiences, including internationally. It entailed foregrounding day-to-day -day concerns of employment, food, education, and provision of basic services. At the same time, though, questions of self-determination were being suppressed. The first Prime Minister of India, Jawaharlal Nehru, he would say that Kashmiris, initially, he would say that they have a right to determine their future. But he also said, and this is important, India would bind Kashmiris in golden chains. And it did. The government intended to ensure that with an improved standard of living and greater prosperity, Kashmiri Muslim sentiments would sh shift in favor of India. The reason why the politics of life is important is that when we look at colonial or settler colonial contexts, the common understanding is that these are places of immense dispossession, violence, war, and marginalization. And of course, many times they are, and this has been the story in Kashmir in the past three, four decades. But then only seeing colonialism as being defined by manifest violence obscures our understanding of the other ways in which colonialism can operate through giving, development, and empowerment, the banality of everyday life. And this is what defined the early years of India's rule in Kashmir. In addition, scholars of settler colonialism have also argued that not all states eliminate their subject populations by killing them off or driving them off the land. The elimination can also occur by assimilation, or what I call integration in the book, where the idea is to rid the people of their own sense of history and identity and bring them into line with the settler state. So the different chapters in the book look at the ways in which India's colonial occupation operated through Bakshi's regime, and specifically through international diplomacy, film, tourism, education, economic development, and cultural reform. For example, chapter three looks at how both Indian film and tourism to Kashmir sought to pr produce Indian colonial desires and anxieties over the occupied territory. Dozens of leading Indian films at this time were made in Kashmir, and Kashmir was often referred to as the top tourist destination in India. Kashmir was a place to be seen and experienced, even if just through the cinematic lens, and then it was a place to be claimed. Another chapter looks at economic development and how India provided the Kashmir state with grants and rice subsidies, policies it only enacted in Kashmir, and also built a collaborator class that became economically develop, uh, dependent on the Indian government. Different aspects of the state building project produced their own subversions or resistance. Um, and later on, Bakshi himself was replaced by another client politician once he served his purpose. Even though his time and power completely entrenched the legal, political, social, um, and social infrastructure of occupation, it did not succeed in emotionally integrating Kashmiris to India. In fact, the decades after his rule led to even greater movements for self-determination. Even if the chains are golden, they still need to be broken. Even though my book aims to shed light on Kashmir's history, my hope is that the book will be useful to other sites that are like Kashmir, and there are many. Kashmir is not exceptional. A number of other nations and communities have been brought into the fold of nation states without their consent, remain under colonial occupation, apartheid, apartheid and war. Modern day borders do not under, adhere to people's understandings of place and history. 
And so modern nation states have used varying modalities of control, whether manifest violence or the politics of life, to establish their rule in these places where they lack legitimacy. But people have and continue to resist. Thanks again for coming, and I'm looking forward to a conversation with uh, my friend and colleague, Janaith, and also uh, for your questions. Thanks. Um, hi, everyone. Um, I would just like to begin by saying um, congratulations to Hafsa for this really critical work. And I'm so happy to see it in book form. Um, some books are literally events in the sense that French philosopher Alain Badiou uh, said that events uh, open a fold within consciousness. You know, um, something unspoken, something that had remained buried or erased comes to the front, which opens new possibilities of uh, imagining, thinking, and acting, you know, or new possibilities of politics. Um, and I firmly believe, after reading this work and after uh, reading Hafsa's work for years, that this is uh, an event. Um, and I'm here speaking both as a scholar of Kashmir, an anthropologist, but as a Kashmiri myself. Um, I know there will be a lot of Kashmiris uh, who will read this book in Kashmir, and they would be extremely happy. They would, uh, and they would, it, it's a cathartic moment for them too, because um, there's something unspoken, this opaque period in Kashmir's history that has remained unarticulated, and unarticulated in, a, in the form that Hafsa has put it in the book. Uh, my own work deals with the post-1990 era in Kashmir when um, there was this uh, mass um, revolt against the Indian rule and the beginning, like a formal beginning of the counterinsurgency war against Kashmiris. Um, but, you know, you can never understand the present without going back into the history. And in my work, what I had often found was that there's a lot of literature on the period 1947. Um, Kashmir gets talked about a lot, you know, the major actors in South Asia left enormous records uh, from uh, Nehru and Patel, who were key actors in this uh, consolidation of Indian Empire, to uh, Jinnah on the other side, you know, the Pakistani politicians. But um, the period right after Sheikh Abdullah's arrest in 1953 somehow is not talked about. It's as if, like, Sheikh Abdullah was arrested in 1953 and nothing happened. Most people do not even remember the names of the successive series of politicians who became crucial to consolidating uh, Indian control in the region. So uh, reading this book, reading Hafsa's work, um, that she has so diligently dealt uh, with the, the limited archives that are made possible to Kashmiris, uh, with oral um, you know, accounts, uh, with the people that she spoke to in Kashmir, a dying generation, unfortunately, who are actually, you know, who want to talk about this period. Um, so, so it's a tremendous service to both Kashmiris and to scholarship on the region. Um, what I want to also add is that the period of 1947, or the, you know, just before 1947 to 53, became uh, foundational in. Uh, understanding Kashmir for the world audience. Because, I mean, for many of you who may not know uh, uh, or who think that Kashmir was on the back, is on the back burner, it was not always like that. Kashmir was uh, at one of the key um, questions at the United Nations. A series of resolutions were passed on Kashmir um, that called for plebiscite, right to self-determination of Kashmiris, ceasefire, demilitarization, um, numerous, you know, international um, uh, commissions, judges, activists went to Kashmir to figure out how to resolve this question. So Kashmir was very much at the center stage. But, uh, and this is where I would like to say that um, the work that happened around then, at that time, the, the fixation on Kashmir as a territorial dispute 
between India and Pakistan as if Kashmir was nothing else, as if it was not a place in itself, it didn't have its own people or its history, um, uh, kind of set the stage of Kashmir's erasure from Kashmir, you know, international consciousness. And um, it has uh, taken decades, literally decades, almost like 60 years for Kashmiris to return focus back on that key question of Kashmiri uh, political subjectivity itself. Um, it, it's quite, uh, I, I think it, it uh, you know, beckons us to kind of recall why this happened. You know, in 2005, um, an earthquake took place in, um, along the line of control, which is the ceasefire li line between India and Pakistan. This was the first time that the Indian government allowed scholars, activists, in initially it was like the, you know, the um, international NGOs that arrived, and it opened, suddenly, you know, scholars started coming in, journalists started coming in, they started discovering mass graves along the line of control, um, and in their trail, Kashmiri scholars followed as well, who had been silenced until then. And from that period, 2005 to around 2019, uh, a new scholarship emerged, which um, we call the Critical Kashmir Studies. Um, a lot of it happened in Kashmir. A lot of it happened in the United States academia. Um, and it began to shift the understanding on Kashmir. I mean, all of us have been beneficiaries of that work that um, has taken place. Um, but now, we're again seeing the Indian government put a lid back on it. Like there are in our midst scholars right now who could not go to Kashmir to pursue their research and have had to fundamentally alter their research. Kashmiri scholars in Kashmir uh, almost need to get a license. I mean, some of you probably know the license Raj in India. They almost need to get a license to do the work that they're doing. Um, the absurdity that Kashmir University has become for Kashmiri scholars, the absurdity uh, that the work on Kashmir has become for Kashmir scholars, and the, not just the silencing, but really the, um, the way the Indian government wants Kashmiris to speak a, a language that is fundamentally uh, an epistemic violence to Kashmiris. Um, it couldn't be worse right now, so that's why this, that these works that are coming out, especially this work, um, Colonizing Kashmir, is um, a, re a rebuke to the Indian regime's um, you know, silencing of Kashmir. Um, that's why it is an event. It's an event because it uh, demonstrates that despite the terrible hardships that the Indian regime, Indian government has put in place, um, against work on Kashmir, against Kashmiris making themselves visible in the international conscience that things are taking place. Um, without um, taking too much time, I think we have quite a lot to discuss. I have a few questions. I'll ask four questions that um, I was thinking about you know, while reading this book, and I, uh, of course, read it with great pleasure. Um, uh, but then we'll open this conversation up to uh, the audience. Um, one of the things that uh, you know, Hafsa's uh, book mentions right in the introduction, and, and that's, I think, the key, um, is the question of um, colonialism itself. You know, the question of that, um, I mean, some of you who are familiar with post-colonial scholarship, uh, for that scholarship, colonialism is in the past. Like, it's something that happened some time back you know, um, and it is only in relationship to the former colonies and their erstwhile colonizers that this question can be asked, right? Um, but uh, what this work does, in my view, is basically break open that question and to reclaim colonialism as a central category to understand the present, right? Um, so I would, uh, if you could like, you know, uh, say a few words about how you sort of see this question um, and trace this connection to colonialism's you know, past and present. How do you deal with this question in your own you know, work? Sure. Okay, so thank you so much, uh, Junaid, for your generous comments. Um, so as you mentioned, colonialism is thought about something as something that happened, and now we are in a post-colonial period. And, we, and decolonization in this kind of framework has already happened. It may be incomplete, it may be imperfect, but 
it's something that has kind of already happened. Um, another term that's often used is neocolonialism. And you may hear that term also being thrown around. It usually refers to the ways in which countries in the global north continue to economically and politically um, uh, exploit countries in the global south. One of the main things that um, I'm hoping that this book does is to reframe our understandings of colonialism as only happening from the global north to the global south, um, and to also attend to the kinds of power differentials that exist within the global south as well. And part of why we don't sometimes think about places like Kashmir as being colonized is that you think that um, the, the kind of the mythologies that the nation states uh, tell about themselves, right, um, are correct or that we have to assume that they're correct. And you also think that because a place is geographically contiguous, right, that they kind of share borders, um, then that kind of makes colonialism not as relevant. Um, and colonialism is only happens something overseas, right? So, so I'm hoping to kind of challenge some of those ideas about colonialism. Now, specifically with India, the question becomes especially important because India has always situated its narrative as one that is anti-colonial. And with its own anti-colonial movement against the British, which got valorized in so many ways, um, Gandhi, of course, the non-violence movement, et cetera. Um, after Indian independence, Nehru became the leader of the third world. Um, India was part of the non-aligned movement, which is also pushing back against colonialism. So all of this history has been romanticized. But think about India as being the leader of the third world movement or of the non-aligned movement while maintaining its own colonial occupa occupation in Kashmir. Um, in many ways, entrenching it even farther because it was able to get away with it in the international community. Um, the other thing, kind of referring to the, the Third World Project, part of what I do is also critique the Third World Project. So there have been some critiques of anti-colonial movements when they eventually became the nation state, meaning that oftentimes they reproduced certain colonial logics or that a lot of the elites, the anti-colonial elites, once they came to power, um, they were also repressive, they didn't really care about the people, etc. So those sort of um, uh, critiques of the Third World Project already exist. But one of the critiques of the Third, Third World Project that I don't think gets talked about as much is that in many ways they kept the same um, understandings of nation states and borders and territoriality and sovereignty intact, which is what they adopted or got from their European colonizers. And so um, I think part of what we also have to do is rethink the idea of territory and sovereignty in this time, and that's also what I'm hoping that this book um, can, can, can help us think about as well. Um, so um, one of the things, especially because um, this book comes out after 2019, and um, um, which is this uh, moment of like settler colonialism coming out in its um, openly, brazenly, in its full form, um, but reading the book, I was also um, kind of, there was some in uncanny parallels between the year 1953 and 2019. Um, not only in terms of how this so-called autonomy that was uh, sort of negotiated between the Kashmiri uh, national conference leaders and Indian leaders at the time, um, it, it was taken away with presidential order, um, and, and you know, Bakshi sort of launching an internal coup within the national conference, but also in um, you know, in terms of how Bakshi went about setting up this enormous repressive uh, apparatus, a surveillance state, a police state, um, which um, I find quite fascinating because this is precisely what happened, you know, uh, which was activated in 2000 and uh, or, uh, uh, in 1990 when Kashmiris launched their mass movement uh, called Tehreek. Um, and, but in 2019, the question of autonomy, again, came to the forefront. It was, it was already diluted, but uh, there, there was a lot more sort of worry in Kashmir about the question of land and uh, demographic alteration, which is like, these are the two key things that uh, settler uh, 
constructs the settler colonial desire, if you will. You know, um, do you see these? Do you see these parallels between uh, these two years? Yeah, I mean, I think so. In India's occupation, which has lasted over seven decades, um, there's been a lot of the use of like what I call modalities of control. Sometimes it's manifest violence, and even in the time that I'm looking at, there is violence as well, even though it's not the main form of control that India uses necessarily. Um, but settler colonial contexts do have um, overlaps, but I think what shifts from different time periods is what the focus or what is being foregrounded in that moment. So for example, in the late 1980s, 1990s, it was this very brutal use of militarization. This is where uh, some of the numbers around human rights violations that you might have heard about, almost 100,000 people being killed, thousands of rapes and forced disappearances, that was what marked this period, right? So there's, um, there's these overlapping techniques that are used, but some are foregrounded in some time than others. Um, for me, what was interesting is, uh, and I wrote the book, I mean, I wrote my dissertation before 2019, had to rewrite it as a book after 2019, and so much, like, that moment helped kind of com completely fundamentally changed how I even saw my period um, in terms of thinking through it more. Um, one thing that I saw as a parallel is the ways in which India and its client regimes normalize its occupation. Um, so for example, in the 1950s and 1960s, the Kashmir state government um, and the Indian government would invite other countries, um, invite Muslim majority countries to come to Kashmir and to see the kind of development that was happening so that Muslim countries would not support Pakistan's calls um, in international forums. They would also, uh, a big high profile trip that happened during the time period that I look at was a visit by the Soviet premiers, the USSR at the time. Um, and so Bakshi took the Soviet leadership around Kashmir, showed them the development that was happening, building of schools, et cetera. Um, and afterwards, the Soviet Union basically supported, the U supported India in international forums um, after, after that visit. And so after 2019, one of the things that we saw, even though India does not allow uh, journalists doesn't allow human rights organizations to Kashmir. They invited far-right European Union parliamentarians to come to Kashmir so that they can say everything is fine, people are happy, there's nothing going on here. Very recently in June, they held the G20 summit, so bringing together uh, leaders of different, um, uh, 20 of the most wealthy countries around the world were brought to Kashmir. Um, and in the lead up before these moments, there's always in, like an incredible amount of violence that happens in the sense that people who the state thinks is going to, uh, are going to resist, they are arrested. Um, and there's also a complete spectacle, spectacle that's put on. So I, the pictures I don't think came up, unfortunately, but um, even in the 1950s, there would be like banners and posters and all of this kind of um, attempt to create a spectacle of normalcy um, and something very similar happened uh, in, in June with the G20 summit. The other thing is the use of tourism and film. Um, so some of you may know the names of these films from the 50s and 60s, Kashmir Ki Kali, Jung Lee, um, there's, uh, there's many more. Um, I talk about them in the book, as well as tourism. So uh, the government did everything it could um, to ensure or to kind of promote uh, middle-class Indian tourists to go to Kashmir. Um, in this time, see it for themselves, develop that emotional attachment to the place. And after 2019, something similar is happening. So if you go on Instagram, you'll see all of these Indian influencers going to Kashmir. And I think there was a time um, when some were putting up signs saying like, Kashmir is safe, meaning there's no violence here, so you all can come. Um, and from family who, or people who have been to Kashmir recently, um, they say that you know, the, the airplanes from uh, Delhi to Srinagar are just filled with Indian tourists. And again, it's this, it's this idea that this is our place, we're going to claim it, and it's, it's ours. So that's a continuity from, from the time that I'm working on as well. Um, and then, of course, there's the use of collaborators. So all of, in all colonial contexts, collaborators are used. Once they serve their utility, they're discarded. Um, but I would say the one main difference that I'm sensing uh, between the period that I was looking at and now is that 
in the period that I'm looking at, there is an, a sort of agency that the Kashmir government, which is a, the client regime, has in that it's able to sometimes negotiate with the Indian state. So Bakshi, for example, was a very shrewd politician. And one of the things that he managed to do is get a lot of Indian funds into Kashmir um, and pushed for a lot of grants and et cetera to be, to be used there um, in order to maintain his, his rule. But now what's happening is that that kind of, um, that, that class of people is also being kind of pushed away as India moves from more of an indirect rule to a direct uh, settler occupation. And so many of the people in power in Kashmir now are actual Indian bureaucrats, um, not Kashmiri bureaucrats. And so the kind of negotiation that Kashmiris may have had on a small level in the past just completely doesn't exist anymore. Um, so I would say that, you know, and this is again what might create that difference between an indirect rule to a direct rule, but otherwise there's just been so many um, similarities in terms of thinking about the past and how India has managed um, its, its occupation. Um, yeah, and um, I also think that uh, we are at a, an interesting moment in um, South Asia as well when um, the Hindutva, which is this Hindu nationalist ideology that has a, a history of the uh, last 100 years, has um, um, from all the sort of uh, uh, understand you can gather, it has like captured the Indian state, you know. Um, it is like at its center now. Um, it, I mean, we've, we've seen violence um, in online videos, um, in um, in place like Manipur, where, which is like part of the Hindutva project to sort of um, demographically alter the people there um, militarize the population against the marginalized populations uh, from the hills, the cookies. Um, but in, uh, or now in, in what is happening in Delhi or uh, the surrounding regions of Delhi, um, from all accounts, it looks like the, the Hindutva has captured the state. Um, and, you know, there was a time when I was in a student in Delhi years ago when BGP used to say that Congress was pseudo secular. Um, they used to use the term pseudo secular to describe Congress because it wasn't secular enough. But nobody talks about secularism anymore uh, in the government um, at all. Um, I, m maybe you could talk a little bit about this term secular and the role it actually play played in Kashmir because um, many, many, many people are now sort of nostalgically looking back at this term secular as if it was. Uh, uh, something that was holding communities together in, in, in South Asia, or at least in India, uh, and what role it played in Kashmir. Yeah. yeah, so given the rise of Hindu nationalism, the rise of Modi um, in India, you sometimes hear from Indian liberals that, you know, we need to return to India's secular ideals. Um, but the Kashmir context, and not just the Kashmir context, but what's been going on in India as well since independence, really puts that question in a different, um, I mean, I think we need to ask that question very differently. Um, and my, what I mean by that is in Kashmir, for example, Nehru would basically say that India's secular ideals were manifested um, by the fact that this Muslim majority region was a part of India, right? So that then proves that India is secular because we have this Muslim majority region. But the question then is what does it mean for India's secular ideals to be manifested through a colonial occupation? This isn't a region that has, has like willingly joined India. So there's, there's that. Um, but also, one of the things that um, happens with this use of the term secular in the Kashmir context is that it erases Muslim political aspirations um, or it attempts to tame them, right? And tells them that the only kind of political aspiration that is legitimate that you can have is to join India. Again, because India is secular, but is India really even secular? So it's like this weird, um, thing that like logic that keeps on um, like reinscribing itself. Um, and so part of what the book looks at is how this language of secularism entrenched India's occupation in Kashmir. It was meant to tame and erase Muslim histories. Um, but it doesn't mean that India was not invested in the question of religion. But part of what I'm also showing is that Hindu geographies, Hindu mythologies, Hindu understandings of history 
is what is actually being foregrounded in this secular Indian nationalism. Um, and that shows the close relationship then between Indian secularism, Hindu majoritarianism, and settler colonialism. So getting out of the Kashmir context then, um, if you look at social media today, obviously what's happening in India with uh, especially Indian Muslims um, and other minorities is horrific. But you often see this hand-wringing from Indian liberals about how things are so bad and how they're shocked at how bad things are. But where were they for the past 70 years? Uh, forget Kashmir. We, we don't even have to look at Kashmir. Look at what was happening in the Northeast. Look what happened in 1984 with the uh, pogrom against the Sikhs. Look at what happened in Gujarat. This is all happening under Indian secular governments. And so, um, the bigger question now, or kind of the urgency, is to look at these longer genealogies of violence um, that emerges from not just Modi, and not just the BJP, and not just the RSS, but a particular uh, mindset, right? A particular mindset that is so seeped in the Indian national psyche. Um, that, I think, is what needs to be challenged. And Kashmir, I think, can help us, help us look through some, into some of that as well. And examples like Nelly, uh, Maliana, you know, uh, Bombay in 1992. There's, there's many, yeah. There's so many examples of... Um, and these are not isolated incidents, yeah. right? They're not exceptional. I mean, they're... And just to think, I mean, even outside of these moments of violence, um, like the experience of Indian Muslims and other minorities in India over all of this time, right? Right. Yeah. Yep. Um, I think that uh, it might be time to open up questions and maybe we can I'll moderate Sadia Hafsa it's such a pleasure to be here um, you know to see this book in print as Janet was saying and just in, enormously like happy for you. And um, I've started reading and haven't finished, but it's, I, I understand what Janet means when he says that the book is an event. So congratulations. Um, and thank you so much for um, sort of opening up the conversation around taking to task critically these discourses about um, Indian secularism uh, and Indian progressive uh, politics and the previous regimes that people have nostalgia for. And I was just wondering, because you talked about um, Nehru's role in the non-aligned movement and the very strategic way in which the Soviet Union was um, invited to, and, and then sided with India in international fora. And so that brings me to this question of Indian leftists, right? So I think Indian liberals certainly have, um, do the hand wringing. But in my experience, Indian leftists have ha had their own blind spot when it comes to Kashmir with, um, with the CPIM in, in fact very explicitly saying that they think that Kashmir is an integral part of India. That's part of their, you know, the, the sort of explicit, explicit statement. Um, so I just wonder if there's some way in which, I don't know whether you do it in the book at all, but as part of the conversation, whether we can open that up as well. Maybe we can take like two or three and then I can answer them all together. Yeah. And if you don't mind introducing yourself as well. Hi, I'm Sadia Tour. Um, I teach at CUNY at the College of Staten Island and I've known Janet from work at CUNY but also just sort of general South Asia solidarity kind of stuff in New York and I've had the pleasure of knowing Hafsa since she was a grad student so it's really exceptionally lovely to see both of them here. Are there any other questions? Thank you. Um, I see what's happening in India is actually a result of concentration of power. Um, in uh, one particular section of India, the upper caste. OK, 
Okay, they benefited from both ways of distributing power. One is democracy, democracy I mean, you know, elections, and the other one is um, selection, you know, by appearing in exams and picking people and putting a administrative power. So both of these ways favored the upper caste and and they have, even before Modi, before the BJP, they reached a, a stage when they controlled every institution of India. Then in 1990, this, uh, what's called Mandal Commission, they wanted to give, re, uh, you know, quotas to the a very big section of India. That's um, OBC, the backward caste people, the people who are not the most backward, most uh, deprived, but in between. And that they, their number is about 50%. And uh, the untouchables, the scheduled caste, they are called, and the scheduled tribes, they constitute about 25%. So altogether it would have been 75% would be reserved for these communities. And that's when they, they're one of the leaders Atal Bihari Bajpayee said, oh, they brought mandal, so they had to bring kamandal. Kamandal means, you know, the difference in the, um, well, Hindu identity had to be stressed, and uh, they went on um, nationwide uh, uh, roaming around and propagating this idea, and and brought down the Babri Masjid and started fighting in between Hindus and Muslims. And that's what's going on, intensifying now. And in 19, uh, in two, uh, 2002, um, Modi was in Gujarat. He, this uh, whole thing, uh, Godra, burning train and all that, I feel was all... So may I request if you uh, to yeah. keep the comment short and yeah, if I'm you have a question. One minute, one minute. And uh, so he, he did that as the chief minister of Gujarat. And now he is in the, he has been uh, in power in the center for nine years. And this time he is planning to win this next year's election by uh, b by doing the same experiments, and not it's no more experiment, but the same mechanism of Manipur burning, and now also in in um, you know, what is it uh, in an, another state, and uh, so basically by attacking Christians in Manipur and Muslims in the other state. And, and sorry, he, do you he have hopes, a question, sir? He hopes to win, win the next year's election by that and also confuse it with the manipulation of the EVM, uh, like electronic voting machines. Thank you. Can you please uh, keep your uh, questions short? Sure. Thank you. Uh, I direct the International Center for Multigenerational Legacies of Trauma. And of course, this is totally related. But your analysis, and this is not a criticism, I'm going to get the book and lose another night of sleep. <laughs> but um, your analysis focused more on the political, economic, religious, etc. dimensions. <clears throat> Yet you did speak about the day-to-day -day experience of colonialism. Uh, and of course, from our point of view, I'd be very interested if you can elaborate on that and also on the, the generation. We are talking about three generations, actually, right? So 
our interest is what do you see as the legacies from generations to generation? Uh, and does the current generation respond differently than former ones? Of course, this is big research anyhow, but. <laughs> okay, maybe I'll start with um, Sadia's question first. Um, so you're absolutely right. Whether it's Indian leftists, progressives, feminists, um, they all have been um, complicit in India's colonial occupation in Kashmir. Um, and part of what they've done strategically is to paint um, the issue as a human rights issue, right? So as long as India treats Kashmiris fine, that, you know, so they'll have these reports. And actually, I think even yesterday, another one of these reports came out where Indian fact-finding missions led by Indian civil society go to Kashmir talk to people, I'm not sure who they're talking to, um, and then they come out with like a list of recommendations. Um, but none of the recommendations or none of their analysis actually gets to the root of the problem, which is an issue of self-determination and an actual, you know, an anti-colonial politics, right? It's always if India treats Kashmiris better, then things will be fine. Um, but in this, in this moment, India actually did, quote unquote, treat Kashmiris better, right? It gave them all of these things which I'm kind of explaining in terms of the politics of life and things were still not fine because the issue is fundamentally one of sovereignty and so there is definitely that blind spot that exists um, but I will say I am seeing like a younger generation of people on the left and others um, people um, like especially Indian um, Indian students right now in different colleges and universities in the US who are kind of trying to push um, back on some of this and thinking through it and interested in at least learning more, um, which did not necessarily exist with the, the previous generations. Um, in terms of the legacies, I mean, so my work, I'm a historian, so I, Janaid is probably a lot better equipped to speak about the intergenerational legacies, but I will say that one of the legacies from this period, um, and I talk about it a bit in the conclusion, is that um, when you have something like the politics of life operating, you create a society where um, there's almost like a, um, like a dissonance within the subjectivities of the people. Because one, you're creating divisions by creating um, like a collaborator class, people who are given these benefits, um, who receive certain benefits from the colonial project, and then their descendants then continue to live off of that. Um, but then, there's also resistance, right? So people have these economic desires, they have these political desires. Um, and so that, that's often seen as like, oh, people are just confused. It means that they don't want freedom or they don't want um, self-determination, but it's very much built into the nature of that, that project. Um, I don't know, Janae, if you wanna speak a little bit more about what kind of intergenerational, I mean, your work on post 1990s and how it may affect that. Um. I th I think the uh, the interesting thing that I found um, reading this book and from my own work was how many um, desires, aspirations, and uh, even slogans sort of uh, were seeping through history. Um, you know, and like for instance, um, Hafsa writes about plebiscite front. Um, which was formed in, after 1953 um, by uh, a group of Kashmiris who were still loyal to Sheikh Abdullah and who still wanted the UN resolutions to be implemented and right to self-determination to be granted. Uh, and many of them were quite radical, you know, and they wanted Kashmir for Kashmiris, as, um, which, which was reasonable. Um, but I found out also that uh, reading that, that in the post-1990 generation, a lot of the ideas that they were articulating were the plebiscite front ideas. You know, that those ideas hadn't died. Um, uh, people were uh, like uh, basically um, connecting their condition in the present to the past. You know, and it happens with or without scholarly work. Uh, you know, it happens because memory passes down. Um, people tell stories, they narrate incidents. Um, and I think what, you know, scholarly work does is kind of give it a formal shape, uh, right? And I think that um, you're, you're absolutely right. Um, uh, and, and I think what colonialism is at the end, it, it is the manipulation of reality. It is gaslighting of the native, of the indigenous people, to tell them to think uh, uh, in a way that is fundamentally against their own interest. 
you know and um the it uses all kinds of uh, things material uh, co-optation uh, violence um, uh, narrative manipulation that Hafsa writes um, in her book um, and but it happens they, they always choose a small subset of population the, the client list regime so that the rest of the majority um, can be suppressed you know to create this layer in between a via a, 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 you know, and, and, as, and a set of people in between who can then become instruments um, uh, in the hand of the colonial state and to give it, uh, in, in many ways, give it um, uh, plausible deniability. I mean, one of the things that, uh, you know, Hafsa writes in her book is that um, some of the archives in the National Archives in Delhi were not available and are still, you know, 75 years later, they're still not available. So a lot of things that were happening, especially who was controlling Bakshi, you know? I mean, yes, there is agency, but um, how are the Indian bureaucrats, officials, police officials, who are coming into Kashmir, what are they trying to set up? You know, that's not still visible, you know, and um, I think that's why I think this is an event because it opens possibilities for new kinds of research as well. Hi, my name is Sonia. I'm a journalist and I'm also Kashmiri. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about any challenges you faced in the process. Um, like, as you know, like information is really hard to access. Like, were there things that you wanted to do, maybe like go there that you weren't able to, or were there fears you had about what you could and couldn't include in the book? Um, yeah, I was just curious if you could address any of those issues. Uh, thank you, Dr. Gunjul, for your time, and congratulations on your book. I have three questions. Two are related, so I hope you could answer them great. Um, so question one is, um, what do Kashmiris think about this blind time of history between 1953 to 1963? And how did you yourself get interested in this time, uh, given that it's so blind in history? And my other question unrelated to that is you talk about nation states and uh, colonialism and we're taught here in the United States um, in your primary schools that nation states are good so can you talk about the similarities of how they view territory and land in colonialism and nation states thank you so much Hi, my name is Devashri. I actually teach film and sometimes show the 60s films just to be able to get this conversation started. Uh, congratulations. I can't wait to read the book. I just wanted to talk to a few things that you mentioned in your intro, right? So I love this uh, use of um, the politics of life uh, framework to be able to talk about this banal everyday state building. A lot of the ways in which you're discussing, and I completely applaud the, the project to kind of rethink colonialism as this ongoing kind of a thing, different from post-colonial historiography, which, as Jeanette has also written, has this nationalist kind of a <laughs> tinge in India since independence. Um, but a lot of the things you were describing, and especially when you started to compare the Kashmir context with other parts of India, were sounding like critiques of the nation state, right? So nation building that's taking place in this Nehruvian time needs many kinds of violences, from the politics of life to just the rendering into bare life. How much of that comparative work are you doing in the book, and what could be some of the potential dangers of that, right? Because these are whether it's Hyderabad, Goa, Telangana, or what have you. They have very different kinds of histories. And I know, and I'm also interested, perhaps, if you could speak to the kind of critique also of ways in which some scholars call differentiate between colonialism and internal colonialism, right? So there are some kinds of ways in which the comparisons can be detrimental. So just wanted to hear you speak about that. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Um, maybe I'll start then with the challenges. Uh, there were many challenges. Um, I guess one conceptual challenge was 
trying to do this work within South Asian history, uh, given the dominance of India and Indian narratives in that history. Um, and I suffered through that for much of my PhD, and it was only as I was writing this book after 2019 um, that I think I finally got out of it. And what helped me is to read widely about other places and to think about Kashmir in relationship to other places um, and not just within this dominant um, kind of uh, hegemonic South Asian or Indian centric narrative. Um, the other, in terms of doing research in Kashmir, I was lucky in that the state archives were made accessible to me. Or, I mean, there's different moments where sometimes they are accessible, sometimes they're not. I got lucky um, and I did a bulk of my work in the state archives. When I went to uh, Delhi to do some archival work to try to get what Junaid was saying, the narrative from the kind of the broader Indian perspective, what the Indian state had in mind, everything I requested came back um, in 2013, 2014 when I was doing my research as non-transferable. I went back again in 2018 and I got some, some material, but not enough. So there is definitely um, just a lot of gatekeeping over knowledge on Kashmir. Um, but I will say, um, well, okay, and then in terms of actual archives and people's personal archives in Kashmir, it's a challenge because, one, people who've been involved in the movement in different ways historically um, are hesitant to trust you. You know, you have to really build that trust with people um, for them to share their materials. And unfortunately, a lot of material has been lost. Um, part of it due to different natural disasters that have happened over the years, but others because, especially in the 90s, um, so many people that I spoke to and I asked, do you have things from this movement or this, um, they destroyed it because army was doing raids into their homes and they just had to destroy a lot of that material. So unfortunately, a lot has been lost, but I will say that I was surprised to see um, like whatever did exist was really helpful. Um, and it showed me, and I think we were talking about this, it showed me that Kashmiris have always been writing against these Indian uh, narratives. They've been writing in English, they've been writing in Urdu, they've been writing in Kashmiri. Um, and it's not just like they're writing factual things, they're writing poetry, they're writing short stories. I, I got a little bit into the, po um, sorry, the short stories and things like that. But um, so there is a vast archive that people can actually access. Now, unfortunately, what's happened now is that as Junaid mentioned in his introductory remarks, academia has essentially like been criminalized. You can't even use the word conflict or occupation if you are trying to work on Kashmir or anything about human rights. Like it's all going to get rejected by universities in Kashmir and most oftentimes in India as well. And so part of what I fear now is for the next generation of scholars is that um, Kashmiris won't be able to work on Kashmir. Um, many people who are abroad uh, will not be able to go back. Many people who are there are not able to do the kind of work that they want to do. And then that leaves the space open for the state to then select what kind of knowledge can be produced about Kashmir, which will be most likely um, done by their own people, right? Indians who will be given access and then will come out with their own nonsense. So, um, so I think the challenges are only gonna get worse from, from here on, unfortunately. Um, in terms of Shaji's questions, so I guess um, for me what was interesting about this period is I, I came into Kashmir um, for my field work. I didn't honestly know what I was looking for. Um, I had just like given my exams and I had written up a proposal that I'm doing something between the, 90, or between the partition and the 90s and it was very vague and I was just like, basically looking around for stuff to help me figure out what it is that I'm actually going to do. I had this sense intuitively that that period doesn't get talked about much, but I didn't really know how I was going to go about it. Um, and uh, when you speak to Kashmiris, like they will give you their rendition, like the Kashmiri rendition of what went down. Like, okay, this is what happened in 47. This is all the mess that Sheikh Abdullah made. And this is when like, and so, Sheikh Abdullah gets written about quite a bit and there's a lot of work on him. Um, Bakshi, did, I had not really encountered much about him. And what I thought was interesting about him is that people called him a traitor um, because of what he did, of course, and he really like firmly like made sure that India was, I mean, uh, the 
like this whole colonial infrastructure was set in place. But he also, um, people also said that, you know, he helped Kashmiri Muslims. And so one story that I heard during my field work is that he um, would go around and like visit towns and villages and people um, would come up to him and these are like Kashmiri Muslims who were completely economically marginalized. Um, even at this time, educational rates were not that good. Um, and he would just like give people jobs on matchboxes or he would just like write them on like small slips of paper and they would be employed. And so I think that to me really represents the politics of life in that you um, know that this is a population that desperately needs economic development and needs empowerment and you're able to then take advantage of that to entrench this this um, colonial colonialism so i think that's probably um, how i started getting interested in this period in particular um, the second question about nation states and the u.s um, yeah i mean this is of course a critique of the nation state um, it's a critique of territoriality it's a critique of how nation states come to be and the kinds of mythologies they tell about themselves. Um, I went to Hawaii recently and um, more than many places in the world, I actually saw a lot of similarities between Kashmir and Hawaii, which I didn't expect to see. And part of it is that in some ways it felt like Kashmir will be um, Hawaii in some decades, unfortunately, in that like this you know, you just completely have broken any sense of um, Hawaiian like sovereignty or self-determination and like the treaties that the US government made with uh, the leadership there completely annulled. Um, and then there's this immense like production of desire over the place, right? And settlement, actual settler colonialism there. Um, and like it's incredibly militarized as well. There's so many US military bases there. And so there's so like I think that's what got me thinking that in in some ways like it's not exceptional. Unfortunately, um, this this has happened before. Um, so yeah, the best your question is really important, and I was actually agonizing about this yesterday because I knew an academic would ask it. Um, so I want to maintain. Um, Again, so yeah, so there are these comparisons, right, of different places, but I also want to maintain like a differential perspective because I, I don't, you know, the kinds of things that happen in Kashmir in the context of a colonial occupation, I think uh, are, not I think, are separate from what the Indian state can do, quote unquote, to its own people, right? And so, of course, the nation state in an attempt to um, consolidate its sovereignty and to ensure that there's like, you know, to protect its interests, et cetera, will go after its own people as well. Um, and it, it does that. Obviously, India has done that in many regions. But I think the Kashmir context is still different because um, one is that it's internationalized um, in ways that other places in India obviously aren't. Um, and two is that there have been movements of self-determination and sovereignty there right from the, the beginning. Um, and three is that the need to use this immense architecture of control um, in all of these different ways, like, you know, it makes it very specific um, than it would in kind of other places, whether it's Chhattisgarh or Jharkhand, et cetera. So of course the nation state is violent and it does these things. Um, and we can talk about the resonances, but I do think it's still important to kind of think conceptually differently about these spaces. Um, Janaid, I don't know if you want to add anything to that. I mean, I think you covered it really well, but I think also uh, you could see resemblances in what happened in 50s in Nagaland, for instance, you know, or um, even in a place like Chhattisgarh, uh, where the the Adivasi population was um, basically crushed and is still being crushed using, um, you know, the tactics that the Indian state learns in one place and employs in other places. Um, I mean, the the key question for me uh, really has always been how 
uh, this Indian state, which basically inherited an empire from the British and consolidated it through wars of conquest and you know uh, manipulation, and uh, has become naturalized in people's minds. But I mean, as Hafsa uh, said, um, uh, not that na the Nagas have given up their aspirations for sovereignty, but the Indian state uses different tactics. You know, it might do one um, sort of treaty with one uh, uh, people, another with another then break it here, not break it there. Uh, but the international dimension of Kashmir sort of gives it a, diff a different resonance. And um, um, for good or for bad, there is Pakistan, right, on the other side, which gives Kashmir a, a sort of a different uh, dimension as well. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think one could use, uh, because the state does that, one could use these analyses to see the resonances with the practices of the state in different places, but I think it helps to conceptually keep them also separate, you know, uh, because Kashmir also shares a um, lot of these resonances with other places. Like, I mean, um, you're absolutely right. I mean, I was, uh, I was in, um, you know, in Cherokee uh, recently in, you know, in North Carolina, and you visit the museum there. I mean, unfortunately, all of this history is now museumized. Um, and, uh, you know, looking at the broken treaties, the trail of tra uh, tears, um, and like the government pushing Scots-Irish farmers into these territories as if they were unpopulated, you know, um, it's precisely what's happening now in Kashmir. When I was, when as, a, as a Kashmiri, when I was reading that, I couldn't but find myself like, you know, as, a, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not as a sort of, I'm, I, know, I know you're not ha hopeless, but the, that I don't wish that upon us in the next 30 years. You know, I hope that uh, there's a different future. But in all these cases that you see around the world, it seems the trajectory is the same. You know, the um, elimination or, uh, or assimilation, and, and um, elimination as assimilation, integration, um, the trajectory seems to be the same. Hi, my name is Purvi. Um, my dad is actually watching the live stream right now and he had a question that he wanted me to ask. So, uh, forgive me. Um, so he's, he's asking two questions. First is, um, is Kashmir a viable country? And two, uh, will Islamic extremism take over or Kashmir to become a country? Yes, thank you. <laughs> okay, any other questions? Thank you so much, Professor Kanjwal and Professor Janaid. Um, I was interested in what you said about Kashmir not being exceptional and the references to the Northeast region and the general sort of colonial militaristic presence of India enforcing its borders. Um, I was wondering, in light of this and the way in which the National Project kind of enforces itself through violence, if there exists room for alternative political imaginations and um, what those imaginations look like and maybe how they're being worked towards maybe within academia or civil society and other spaces. Thank you. Um, so one of the things I was wondering, if, like, the shift in your research to looking at these grants and like this focus on development was directly related to the loss of archival knowledge you were talking about. Um, I am thinking a little bit, not directly about Kashmir, but about, about um, the way all the political rhetoric in Sri Lanka has, focused, has switched to debt and how that's completely suppressed con uh, conversations about self-determination and whether it is like correct to understand the politics of life as the transforming everything into like economic concerns and eliminating all other political concerns because you have a development agenda. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Um, 
My question concerns kind of the, uh, the macro trends here over, over hundreds of years, let's say. Um, you know, you mentioned earlier in the talk the, uh, your, your aim to historicize this situation. And also, you just mentioned more recently such uh, uh, cases as Hawaii um, in terms of this grand colonial project. Uh, do you see this movement of uh, India West kind of uh, closer to the center of the world, just to be really vague about that, um, that geography, because I'm, I'm thinking about that with the, uh, the other superpowers, the USSR, uh, you know, a couple decades ago, and uh, they were in Afghanistan too, and, and China with the Uyghur people. Do you see this as like a, a larger land grab by superpowers um, on uh, uh, the lands of historically, uh, historically the lands of Muslim people and the, towards the center of the world? Are there a lot of, um, the land must be uh, vastly rich in resources. Uh, and it, if so, if you see that as a macro trend, um, what is the role, this is a somewhat related, what is the role of the internet in suppressing uh, the, the academia in Kashmir to talk about this? Like, is it a similar kind of closed internet system that, uh, say, a superpower like China has? Um, thank you. Hi, Hafsa. Thank you so much for your talk. Um, my name is Sarah. I'm a journalist here in New York. Um, I had a question about the erosion of Kashmiri identity. I think you kind of brought it up with like influencers and just within pop culture, like a very feminized Indian of India is like the conqueror of like Kashmir as a woman. So I wonder with that erosion of identity um, for the last few decades, how you see that happening today? Okay, um, so the first question about viable. I would love to ask your dad what country is viable? What does that even mean? Is the US viable as a settler colonial project? Um, is India, is India viable? I just wanted to say well, only one thing to that. I, I don't think these questions are valid, but uh, until 1947, Kashmir, uh, and its writ written records go back uh, hundreds of years. Kashmir was a country, you know, um, long before India existed a as a country. Kashmir was a country. So, okay, um, the alternate political imaginations. Um, I think those are desperately needed. Um, and I think, I mean, there is scholarship, I think now in academia, that's thinking about going beyond the nation state. Um, and in some ways we are already beyond the nation state because the way that global capital operates, and I think this relates to your question as well, is um, it's made like the nation state uh, in some ways redundant. I mean, there I'm thinking about like all of these different alliances and geopolitical realliances and all of that. Um, so there's, there's a lot going on that is pushing the world in a really disastrous um, direction. And of course now with uh, climate change and all of these ecological concerns that, that, that's you know, at the forefront of many of our minds as well. And Kashmir is a site for some of that violence as well, um, which often doesn't get talked about. Um, but I think, I think we, um, we need to have more of those conversations. And when we talk about decolonization, um, one is to not just make it about like representation, which I think it's hap is happening unfortunately in the U.S. Academy, where um, the idea is that if you just bring up more people of color, like somehow we're decolonized. That's not how it works, right? So, um, so yeah, I think that needs to happen. This book is a very small contribution to maybe helping us think about why we need to do that, uh, and maybe the next book that I write will. Try to, or try to answer some of that as well and how it might be possible in terms of alternative political imaginations. Um, okay, so debt, yeah, I absolutely agree. I think like forcing, um, or the one of the things that the politics of life does is, and that was the understanding, is that this is more economic and everything can just be resolved if you 
throw money into it or make it as an issue um, of capital. And that's also what creates that dependency too, right? Because if you can think about how um, Kashmiris now and even today who, uh, it's not like they can live without money, right? So, so many, unfortunately, so many businesses, so many um, things get entangled in that, in that web as well. And the way that I think about it is that people are actively participating in their own subjugation, unfortunately. That's what the pol politics of life also results in. Um, uh, to your question, yes, uh, India suppresses the internet extensively. Um, I think it's number one in terms of the num like in terms of uh, the number of internet shutdowns, and most of those shutdowns have happened in Kashmir um, in recent years. And even when the internet is not shut down, it's monitored heavily to the point that right now Kashmiris know that if they are on social media, they are absolutely being monitored and watched. And so there is not much happening on social media um, as there was, for example, in the years following 2010 when Kashmiris were really using the internet for, you know, um, to register and like bring forward their narratives. Um, erosion of Kashmiri identity. Uh, so one of the things that I think is really interesting, I mean, I know you asked about the present, but Part of what India was trying to do in the 50s and the 60s, and it has built up this understanding of it, or it, the idea was that there's unity in diversity. So Kashmir's cultural identity, meaning its language, dress, food, etc., was not a threat to the Indian nation state. In fact, it was something that was meant to be integrated or assimilated, like look at us, like, you know, and some of these cultural programs that the state would um, promote in the 50s and the 60s would feature, would actually feature this. So um, I think that is in some ways still used because if you look at some of the videos or the images from G20, you would see this like same picture of Kashmiri women in their ferens and the tilla and all of that. So I think the cultural identity angle, I'm, I'll be curious to see what happens in this new settler colonial phase. Um, but historically, it's, it's not like, um, and I guess the d most direct comparison can be with the Palestinian context, it's not like an erosion of that cultural identity, but it is an erosion of Kashmir's Muslim histories, uh, Muslim identity, um, and other like uh, political aspirations, right? I think that's it. Is Leanne here to wrap it up? Okay. All right. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you, Hafsa and Junaid for such an uh, engaging discussion. And I hope that if you weren't convinced to read the book that you are now going to read it. And I've heard that we're almost out of copies. So I hope most of you already got your copy. If not, there's a way for you to pre-order the next one um, because I think we quickly sold out actually. So uh, feel free to stay, uh, mingle, chat. Uh, Hafsa, I believe we'll be signing books as well, and I'm sure the discussion will continue. Um, I think that uh, there's also some snacks uh, available, so please uh, enjoy the rest of the evening, and thank you all for coming. <laughs>